Did you know there's really only two ways for human beings to get along in the world? Hi everyone, this is Ken DeLong, author of The Economic Comet. And today what I'd like to talk to you is about is how you can get along in the world, how human beings can make their way through life. Now before we start into this discussion, uh, let's get a little background here so we understand uh, you know, some facts that are obviously true, but people seem to forget them quite a bit. So human beings need stuff to live, right? We're not like seaweed, right? If you're a piece of seaweed, you're floating in the ocean, the sun shines on you without any effort, minerals and nutrients float to you in the water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, everything just comes to you. You just kind of sit there and photosynthesize and life's great. You, can, you don't have to do anything, right? Uh, basically, the ocean just washes food into your mouth, more or less. Um, for human beings, not so much, right? We have to get our own food. We have to make our own clothes. We have to build our own houses. We have to, anything that we want above, like rolling in the dirt, we have to go and act in order to get that stuff, right? So the fundamental, like, contradiction of human existence is in order to get the stuff that we need, including food, shelter, and clothing, uh, we need to do work to get those things. But in general, we don't like doing work. Like we'd much rather be like a piece of seaweed and just hang out and like drink a beer and watch TV. Like, can't someone just bring the beer to me and can't someone just install the TV? Why do I have to do anything, right? That's the human condition. So how do we get the stuff that we need? Well, there's actually a handful of ways you can do this. Uh, there's only really two, though, that actually count. So let's get rid of some of the other possibilities before we start with the real two. So, like, one way you could get through life is completely on charity, right? Kind of like a little kid, right? When you were six years old, you didn't do anything to get your own food, or you didn't make your own clothes. You didn't earn your way through the world. Your parents just gave you everything, right? So if you could find, as an adult, you know, a sugar daddy like that, right? Someone who's going to just take care of all your needs with nothing required from you. They're just going to give you food and shelter and clothing and furniture and a nice bed and a good TV and a cell phone. And you just have to like sit there and accept it. Um, that's a way of getting through life, but that's pretty unlikely. I mean, I'm sure there are some people who manage to get through life like that, uh, but I think the number's pretty small and I don't think it's something that we could all count on hey, here's how I'm, here's how I'm going to live my life. I'm going to just let someone else do everything for me. Yeah, unlikely. Okay, a second way that I want to address about getting the stuff we need to live is doing it all yourself, right? Like the proverbial mountain man who's dropped off in the middle of a giant nature preserve um, with nothing, and they just do it all themselves. They make their own tools. They get their own food. They kill their own animals, make their own clothing um, all by themselves, right? So there's, there's no, that's certainly, you know, not outside the realm of possibility, right? But there's two things about that. First of all, the number of people in this world today who could actually survive like more than a couple months like that is probably extremely small. Maybe, I don't know, 100,000, 10,000, who knows? Um, I would be surprised if there's a million people in the world who could actually last, say, six months uh, without utilizing anything that other human beings create or make. Uh, and the second thing of that is even for the people who could make it like that, their life would be like abject poverty, right? Like you'd barely have enough to eat. You'd never have, a, um, you know, you probably wouldn't usually have enough food. And you'd never have any of the advanced things we have in civilization. Like, you'd probably never have a pillow, right? You certainly would never have a, f a cell phone or electricity or a, a metal knife or anything like that. Like, you would have the crudest possible tools. You'd basically be a caveman, right, living a lifestyle of, like, 200,000 years ago. Zero. All, the only technology you would have is what you could create for yourself with your two, starting with your two bare hands and rock sticks. So this idea of, like, uh, living all by yourself and uh, doing everything by yourself is really not a practical means that we need to consider. Uh, so in general, you're going to need to acquire things that other people create, right? If you want a mattress, you're probably not going to make the mattress yourself unless you work for a mattress company. You're probably going to have other people make that, and somehow you need to acquire it. If you want a cell phone, 
unlikely that you build your own cell phones. You probably go to a company that makes cell phones and get it from them. Uh, you want to have a car, you want to have a pencil, you want to have a pair of eyeglasses. Again, you might be an optometrist and you might be able to grind your own lenses and produce your own eyeglasses, but the vast majority of people cannot. So we have to get our eyeglasses from people who make them, right? So how do you do that? This is where we come to the real, the two ways that you can get what you need from other human beings. And the first one is by peaceful exchange, right? So the idea is, let's take it back to, again, this is the economic comic, so let's take it back to a comic book level. You have one guy, uh, an apple farmer, who grows apples, and you have another guy who, I don't know, grows oranges or makes eyeglasses or something like that. Let's say it's eyeglasses, right? And the apple farmer wants some eyeglasses. How's he going to get them from that guy? Well, if we're in the realm of peaceful exchange, the apple farmer is going to grow a bunch of apples, and he's going to take them over to the optometrist's house, and he says, hey, guy, can you make me some eyeglasses? because uh, I'll give you all these apples if you can, you know, four bushels of apples if you can make me a pair of reading glasses. And if the optometrist thinks that that's a good uh, exchange, then the exchange happens and both parties walk away happy, right? So this is the idea of free exchange, peaceful exchange, voluntary exchange. The idea being that you concentrate on whatever it is you can do. If you're an apple farmer, you grow apples. And if what you do is valuable to other people, they will trade you stuff for that, right? So if people like apples, now if the optometrist doesn't like apples, he may not go in on the trade. And there's, well, if you're in this mode of peaceful exchange, there's not much you can do about it if the optometrist says, uh, no, thank you, right? Um, so this type of living is what the sociologist uh, Franz Oppenheimer called the economic means. So this discussion we're having today is based on the work of the sociologist Franz Oppenheimer, and he identified the two means of surviving in the world. The first one is the economic means, which is what we're talking about, which is peaceful exchange, uh, where you produce whatever you can produce. Maybe you grow apples, maybe you grow oranges, maybe you make eyeglasses, maybe you give haircuts, maybe you wash cars, maybe you design cars, maybe you write software, maybe you manage groups of people and companies, whatever it is that you do that other people find valuable, you do it and then they reward you. Now, the reward you get now is it's not normal that we barter anymore, right? You don't usually take four bushels of apples to the optometrist's house and ask for some eyeglasses. We usually use money, right? The advantage of money is, of course, that if the optometrist doesn't like apples and you're an apple farmer, you're not stuck unable to ever get eyeglasses in your life, right? Because you can go there and, and you can take your apples and sell it to someone who does like apples. They give you money and now you can take that money to the optometrist and get your eyeglasses. So instead of trading good for good, normally we trade goods for money because money is much more um, convenient, right? It's divisible and... Um, it's kind of, it forms like one half of every transaction. So you can buy stuff for money, you can sell stuff for money. And that way, whatever you do, let's say um, you are a massage therapist and you need to acquire some things from some people who never get massages. They don't care. How in the world are you going to do that, right? You say, hey, I'll give you like four massages. They're like, nah, we don't want them. So how do you get their, uh, you know, their apples or whatever it is that, they're, that they produce? Well, it's easy. You can give massages to people who want them and they give you money and then you can take that money and go to the apple farmer, right? So money is like a form of deferred consumption instead of, uh, from the optometrist's point of view, instead of getting the apples from the apple farmer, which now he has apples that he has to eat, instead he can get money and he can hold on to that money and he can either immediately go out and buy food or clothing or whatever he wants, or he can hold on to the money and and use it in the future sometime, tomorrow, next week, next year, to get the things that he wants, right? So the fact that we're using money doesn't uh, negate the, just, uh, this discussion of the economic means, right? The two ways of, of surviving. Uh, it just puts a layer in between the, the pieces of the transactions of barter. Okay, so just to re recap, method number one is produce whatever it is you can produce that other people find valuable. And then you take that output and you trade it for the things that you want, right? So if you're a policeman, you trade your policing for a cell phone, if that's what you want, or 
you know, this goes on and on. You can do whatever you want. Okay, so you say that that sounds like pretty much what everybody does, isn't it? Like we all go to work, we do what we can, our bosses hired us because they value what it is that we do, and then they give us money for our efforts. Or we're, we make things directly. Uh, we make furniture, or we grow apples or something. Uh, farmers, you know, grow broccoli and they take it to the farmer's market and they sell it directly to the people who want it, right? So you, you produce something and your production then is sold on the market and then you get money for that and then you can go acquire whatever you want. That's the economic means. The other way, the second way, way number two, of getting the things that you need is to just take them by force, right? So if you need carrots, you go to the farmer's market, you punch the carrot farmer in the face and you take his carrots and you walk away, right? Or uh, if you need a house and somebody else just build it, built one, you go in there and maybe you kill everybody and you take their house, right? Or if you need... Um, you know, eyeglasses, you go to the optometrist and you point a gun at his head, you say, make me eyeglasses or else, and then he makes them for you, and then you just take them and walk out, right? You don't exchange anything for it. It's basically, basically it's theft, right? You give nothing back in return. You produce nothing. You just use violence or the threat of violence uh, in order to steal from other people, in order to take the output that they've created and take it for yourself, right? So... There's several problems with this, right? I hope you see that. Like, number one, you know, it's immoral, right? Like, that's, uh, you know, go back 6,000 years to the Ten Commandments, and it's like, thou shalt not steal, right? It's been known in every moral code since the dawn of history that stealing, killing, threatening people with violence, these are bad things, right? So it makes you an immoral person. So that part is really bad. But the second thing that's a little more subtle, and I hope you see this, is that in the economic means, if you want to get something, if you want a pair of eyeglasses and you're an apple farmer, you need to grow some apples, right? Because growing some apples, you know, in the barter scenario means you can take apples to the optometrist and say, hey, I need some eyeglasses. You're like, okay, cool. That's a good, that's a good trade. Or in a money economy, you can sell them on the market for money and then you can take that money to the optometrist and, and get what you need, right? But the idea is that if you want to consume something, you have to produce something first. You have to do something in order to earn the money to go get the stuff that you want. And so uh, you're going to consume things. That means you're going to take them out of society and take them for yourself. You're going to eat some apples. You're going to get a pair of glasses that you're going to wear. You're going to get some clothes that you wear and no one else can wear them now. So you're taking those goods out of society. That doesn't sound good, right? But you had to put something back in in order to get this, right? You had, to, you had to produce something that somebody somewhere valued to get the money to buy the clothes, right? So it all but kind of balances out in that case. Like, you don't get to consume stuff unless you've produced a matching amount of stuff. That way, the, the amount of stuff kind of stays, hopefully, hopefully it grows, but at least it stays constant, right? In the other means, by the way, the other means are called the political means. Um, by Oppenheimer, where you use violence to take what you want. You walk up to the apple farm and you say, give me your apples, and you just take them and, and walk away, and then you eat the apples. Okay, so now those apples have been taken out of the economy, they've been taken out of society, you've consumed them, but you didn't replace it with anything. You didn't produce anything to compensate the world for the loss of the apples that you just consumed, right? And so every time someone uses the political means to get things, I hope you can see that this impoverishes the world in general. They feel better, right? They got to go up to the apple farmer and just grab like five bushels of apples and run off and go, you know, sit in their cave and eat it or whatever they do. Uh, they didn't have to produce anything at all, but now the farmer's out five bushels of apples and, and the person who took the apples didn't produce anything to compensate the world for those apples. Right? And you can make the same argument about any set of goods. You know, you go to the clothing store, if you steal the clothing, uh, then you didn't actually produce anything to compensate the world for you taking those clothes off the shelf. Those clothes could have gone to someone else who needed them maybe more, or who was growing lots of apples, or making lots of eyeglasses, or doing something that benefits society. Those clothes could have gone to them, but because you used the political means to take those clothes away through violence, uh, they got consumed without any production. So in the political means, 
society gets poorer and poorer and poorer, right? The more people that engage in the political means, the more people who consume without producing and who um, take out of society without putting back in, the poorer everybody gets. And by the way, uh, if we go back to our very first thing where we said living on charity, uh, that's kind of the same thing, right? Like you're consuming, consuming, you know, you, whoever your, your, uh, your benefactor is, is just giving you food and shelter and clothing and internet connections and six packs of beer and chips and salsa, whatever it is that you're taking, you're taking that all out of society, consuming it, using it for yourself, and you're not putting anything back in. So, you know, the whole world can't live on charity. Someone's got to make this stuff. Right? So um, another thing we uh, often talk about is that wealth just doesn't exist, right? Apples, someone has to grow them, someone has to pick them, and then someone takes them and they consume them, and now they're gone. And now if you want more apples, someone's got to go grow some more, right? Clothing, somebody has to shear the sheep and make the, the wool and make some yarn and knit it into a sweater, and then you can wear that for, you know, 10 years, and then it falls apart, and now it's gone. you got to make a new one, right? All the stuff we have around us, the, you know, cars, clothing, furniture, houses, uh, glasses, silverware, everything, it's all falling apart. It's all decaying. 100 years, you know, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 500 years from now, it's not going to be here anymore. So it constantly needs to be replaced, right? Wealth, nothing lasts forever in this world, including any of the material wealth we have. And so wealth is not a thing, it's a process, right? It's a process of taking, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, silverware, you're mining metals from out of the earth and you're smelting them down and you're casting them, and you're making nice pieces of silverware and then that goes to people and they use it. And then after a certain amount of time, it gets rusty or it gets broken or it gets lost or something. And, and now someone has to start that process again, right? So. Uh, if you're doing something like the political means, you're shortcutting that process, right? You're just chopping it off. You're taking the produced goods, consuming them without contributing to the production of anything. So if you do that, it's like um, wealth is like a giant water tank with a hole in the bottom and water pouring in the top. And if you, uh, the more water, the so water coming in the top is production and the water flowing out the bottom is consumption. If you just consume, if you just go drilling more holes into the bottom of the water tank without increasing the flow into the top, eventually it's going to go dry, right? Every extra hole you put in makes it fill up that much slower, and eventually it's going to start draining, and eventually it's going to go dry, and there won't be anything left for anyone. Now, you might wonder why Oppenheimer called the second way the political means. It's an interesting choice of words, right? You kind of get the first one, economic means. Okay, that's the economy, right? We all work and then we get some money and then we go out and buy stuff. That's the economy, right? Um, but what is the, why the political means for this way of stealing? And it comes from Oppenheimer's uh, observation that throughout history, if you trace sort of the history of government back in time, it's generally been an elite class like the kings what did the kings provide, the nobles in Europe, you know, in the Dark Ages? What did they provide for the, um, the population? Maybe they provided a little bit of security. Probably not. You know, they probably just secured themselves and their own friends. They really didn't provide anything, but they consumed. They taxed everybody, and they took some percentage of their stuff and ate their food and took their clothes and married their daughters and did all this stuff, and really without giving much back. Um, kings didn't really produce anything. The dukes didn't really produce anything. Um, they mostly consumed by harvesting the output of other people through taxes, right? So Oppenheimer noted that government is the organization of the political means, right? A thief that just goes out and snags your cell phone and then runs away, okay, that's the political means, but it's kind of unorganized. It's just like an opportunistic theft or some guy who breaks in your house and steals your clothes or whatever. Uh, your, your TV or something, right? That's sort of an oppor opportunistic theft. But if you really want to steal from people consistently so that you can set up a nice lifestyle on it, you have to form a government, right? You need to tax. You need to be able to, to, um, to extract a large amount of wealth consistently from the people who produced it. And you don't really have to give anything back at all. I mean, it's not like governments don't give anything back, but 
when you add up the numbers, you get back way, 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 way less than you've actually paid for, right? Um, if you could uh, pay for all the government services on a fee basis, and um, people have done this calculation, like you, you could easily get everything that we're getting now that you might want at like, you know, one fifth the price or something like that. So where's all the rest of the money going? It's going down the tubes of the political means. So just to recap, really two ways of getting by in the world. Uh, the economic means, which is the way of produce what you can, trade it for what you want uh, peacefully, voluntarily. That is called the economic means. And then the political means is uh, don't produce anything, just take what you want. Take, go to people who have produced things and just remove it from their possession, either through theft, through taxes, or through inflation, money printing, or whatever other way uh, you have of uh, acquiring other people's output, and then you don't actually have to produce anything. Now remember, in the economic means, um, especially in a monetary economy, for reasons I won't go into now, every time you exchange, every time you go to the optometrist and buy a pair of eyeglasses, or someone buys your apples, or something like that, uh, society tends to get a little bit richer, like the water tank fills up a little bit. Um, it's, that's a long discussion. I won't, I won't do that now. In the political means, it's very clear that every time someone consumes something without producing, the water tank goes down a little bit, right? Everybody gets a little bit poorer. And if enough people consume without producing, let's say if, if the government raises the tax rate to 90% on everybody and then we just fill the world with civil servants, we're all going to starve to death, right? because nobody else will be able to produce anything, um, or the, the amount of people left producing will ne not be sufficient to feed everybody and clothe everybody and buy cell phones for everybody who's left, who's living off the political. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that discussion. Uh, this is Ken DeLong, author of The Economic Comic, and I'm just reminding you, uh, don't listen to what mainstream bozos tell you. Think for yourself. Form your own opinions. Use your own brain to think through these scenarios. And if you do that, I'll see you again here on the next video. Hey guys, if you want to understand more about economics, but you're just tired of the jargon and the techno babble of professional economists and media pundits, then check out my book, The Economic Comic, which is available on Amazon. There you can learn some of the concepts of economics through comics. Thanks for listening.